Hello, Garland Nixon here. And, you know, with all of the talk and fear of a nuclear confrontation, um, I am uh, fortunate to bring on a, uh, a historian and a man who is very familiar with that situation, who I'm sure can enlighten us. Let's talk. Well, that didn't work out well. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Peter Kuznick is the director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. He's the author of Beyond the Laboratory, Scientist as Political Activist in the 1930s America, co-author of Akira Komoro of Rethinking the Atomic Bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and much, much more of a fantastic, outstanding project with um, a documentary that he did with Oliver Stone. We'd be, uh, I would use my whole hour up if I talked, if, if I um, gave uh, 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 enumerated the accolades of Dr. Peter Kuznick. But let's talk a couple of things. With all of the talk of nuclear confrontation and the legitimate fears now, let's start off with a bit of history. Talk about the political situation leading up to the um, bombing of Nag Nagasaki in Hiroshima. The things we need to know. Were people saying there's going to be a nuclear war? Did they even know there was a nuclear bomb? Was there a discussion? What was the discussion inside the political circles and your thoughts on all of that? Well, hi, Garland. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, let's start with, with the... Uh, building the bomb. I mean, this was done in complete secrecy. <clears throat> Not only were the American people in the dark, but Harry Truman was in the dark. Truman had been vice president for 82 days before Roosevelt died. During that time, he met with Roosevelt twice. They spoke of nothing significant. And the stunning thing is that Truman did not find out the U.S. was building the atomic bomb, until after he was sworn in as president on April 12, 1945. And that was partly because it was so secret, but mostly because people had such low regard for Harry Truman that they didn't even bring him into the conversation. You have to remember that Truman was not very well known, not very popular, He'd gotten elected to the Senate in 1934 after four other candidates had turned Boss Pendergast down in running for the Senate. Uh, he finally chose Truman and got Truman elected. In fact, Truman was considered to be such a puppet of the Pendergast machine that his nickname was the Senator from Pendergast. And most of the other senators completely shunned him. They would have nothing to do with him because they thought of him as a corrupt party hack. That was unfair. He was part of the Pendergast machine in Kansas City, but he was probably the most honest member of the Pendergast machine. But in 1940, he was running for re-election, and he was coming in third. Even though he'd been a loyal New Deal Democrat, Roosevelt didn't support him and he's coming in third. He couldn't rely on Pendergast because Pendergast was in federal prison in Kansas City at the time. And so he turned to the Hannigan-Dickman machine that ran St. Louis, and they barely pushed him over the top. But he was a non-entity. During the second term, he did head up an important investigation of the military spending. And that it didn't uncover anything, really, but at least gave him a bit of a national reputation. So when 1944 comes around, the vice president between 1941 and 45 was Henry Wallace, who was a great vice president, a brilliant progressive, the most progressive man to be that close to the presidency in American history, with the possible exception in certain ways of Thomas Jefferson, 
who was a leader of the American Revolution, despite having flaws and other shortcomings in other areas, obviously. Uh, but so the party bosses wanted to get Wallace off the ticket. They knew that Roosevelt was very, very weak and would never survive another four-year term. So they put pressure on Roosevelt, who did cave to some degree. But still, it was not a fait accompli, because even though the convention was fixed in a sense, uh, the, on July 20th, 1944, the day the Democratic Party convention began in Chicago, Gallup released a poll of potential voters asking them who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 65% said they wanted Henry Wallace back as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman. If you do the math, 65 is a little bit more than two. But you know, in our great democracy, things don't always turn out with the majority. And in this case, uh, even though at the first night of the convention, there was a spontaneous demonstration for Wallace and Claude Pepper, the senator from Florida, a huge Wallace supporter, seeing what was happening, knew that if he could get to the podium and get Wallace's name in nomination that night, he would sweep the convention, defy the bosses, be back on the ticket as vice president. Pepper fought his way to the microphone, got within five feet of the microphone when Sam Jackson said, I have a motion to adjourn. All in favor say aye. Maybe 5% said aye. All opposed say no. Everybody yells out no. And he says, motion carried, meeting adjourned. Had Pepper gotten five more feet to the microphone on that night, then Wallace would have been back as vice president. He would have become president on April 12th, 1945, instead of Truman. And there would have been no atomic bombing in 45 and probably no Cold War. So that's how close we came. It's a tragic story that's been white forgotten by American public and, and forgotten by history because Wallace has largely been written out of the history books, which is very, very unfortunate. Okay, so back to 1945 and the end of the war. So now Truman knows uh, that, that the United States is building the atomic bomb. But Truman also knew that there was no need to use the atomic bomb. Back starting in April, if not earlier, the American intelligence, the Joint Intelligence Committee to the Joint Chiefs of Staff began issuing reports saying that effectively that the thing that would convince the Japanese that further fighting was futile was the Soviet entry into the war. The mighty Red Army, which had defeated the uh, Nazis, you know, another story that Americans don't know was the role played by the Soviet Union in World War II. We just celebrated, just commemorated D-Day. And we did it in a totally farcical manner, which we can get into. So after the Red Army defeats the uh, Germans in Europe, but in, in February of 1945 at Yalta, Stalin promises Roosevelt that the Soviets will come into the Pacific War three months after the end of the war in Europe, which would mean right around August 8th or August 9th. Uh, and American intelligence have been saying that Soviet entry will convince all Japanese that the war is over, that there's no reason to fight anymore. Uh, there's a lot to the story. But the Japanese were already defeated and knew they were defeated. In fact, beginning as early as July of 44, with the, uh, the defeat at the Battle of Saipan, the Japanese knew they could not win. In February of 45, former prime minister uh, writes to the emperor and says, I regret to inform you, but defeat is inevitable. What we have to do is make sure there's not a communist revolution accompanying uh, Japanese defeat. Uh, so for the next few months, they're maneuvering to try to get themselves the best surrender terms. And they decide that the best way to do that is to get the Soviets to intervene on their behalf and get them better surrender terms. What most of them wanted was the promise that they could keep the emperor. They didn't want to see the emperor tried as a war criminal and hanged. 
because that the, then the emperor was a deity. Right. And so that was uh, totally unthinkable. As MacArthur, Southwest Pacific Command, says in a background briefing in the summer of 1945 that the execution of the emperor to them would be like the crucifixion of Christ to us. All Japanese would fight to die like ants. So they knew that that was the main stumbling block. They also knew it because we had broken the Japanese codes and we were collecting their, and intercepting their telegrams. And the telegrams going from ambassador, uh, for Foreign Minister Togo in Tokyo to Ambassador Sato in Moscow said things like July 18th, uh, the only obstacle to peace is the demand for unconditional surrender on our part. We knew that. Truman refers to the intercepted July 18th telegram as the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. He knew they were trying to surrender. We all knew that. All of his advisors knew that also. Uh, so, so Truman goes to Potsdam on July 16th, 15th, and meets with Stalin for over lunch on July 17th. And Stalin assures him that the Soviets are coming in on schedule. Truman writes, goes back and writes in his diary that night, Stalin will be in the Jap war by August 15th. Finny Japs when that occurs. It's actually gonna be earlier than August 15th. He writes home to his wife Bess the next day, said that the Russians are coming in. We'll end the war a year sooner now. Think of all the kids who won't be killed. They knew that there was no excuse for using the atomic bombs. They were totally unnecessary. And the country and the people who knew that the best were the Soviets because the Japanese had been trying to get them to intervene on Japan's behalf. The, the former Japanese prime minister, Hirota, met with the Soviet ambassador, Malik, in Tokyo several times in early June and Malik writes back to the Kremlin saying that the Japanese are desperate to surrender. The Japanese the Soviets knew that better than anybody. And so when the United States uses the bombs on August 6th and August 9th in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the reaction in the Kremlin was that the target of the bombs was not, not only Japan, but the Soviet Union, that the United States was sending a message of its ruthlessness, that it'd be willing to kill hundreds of thousands of innocent Japanese women and children in order to send a message to the Soviets that if they interfered with America's plans in Europe or in Asia, this is what they were going to get and worse, far worse than what the Japanese suffered. So the, 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 it's beyond atrocity. And it's beyond atrocity even more so because Truman knew that he was beginning a process that could end all life on the planet. He, he writes when he gets his first briefing on April 13th, uh, Jimmy Burns flies up in Secretary of the Navy Forrestal's private jet for Spartanburg, South Carolina, and gives Truman a briefing about what's going on. Uh, and how the Soviets are, are, are threatening and, and breaking their agreements. And Truman writes that Burns told me that this may be a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. He gets his first briefing. He gets a fuller briefing on April 25th from General Leslie Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, and Secretary of War Stimson. And they tell him that within four months, we're going to have a weapon one bomb of which can wipe out an entire city. And Truman says, writes in his diary after, he writes a memo saying uh, that they told me that, uh, that what we do with this weapon will determine the future of mankind. And Stimson said in the meeting that even if we have this weapon, we probably shouldn't use it because it can end up destroying life on the planet. Then at Potsdam, Truman gets a full briefing on the power of the bomb. And he uh, says, we discovered the most terrible bomb in history. This may be the fire destruction 
prophesied in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. Not a bigger, more powerful bomb, but the fire destruction. And so Truman, knowing after getting the reports on the bomb test at Almogordo and how powerful that was, Truman, knowing beginning a process that could end all life on the planet, still goes ahead and uses the bomb, even though there was no military justification, even though it did not speed up the end of the war. As the experts all predicted, the Japanese cabinet discussions after Hiroshima and Nagasaki was all about the Soviet invasion, which began at midnight on August 8th. It was not about the bomb. And if you go to the official U.S. Navy Museum here in Washington, D.C., it's got a display about the end of the war and says that the Japanese cabinet deliberations focused entirely on the Soviet invasion of Japan uh, and not on the atomic bomb. You know, and we knew that that was going to be the case, but we wanted to use it. Truman wanted to use it. So the American public knew nothing about it. And then they were told these lies, that the bomb was necessary to avoid an invasion. Wow. Even Obama, you know, who's the relatively decent as American presidents go, Obama finally went to Hiroshima in May of 20, 2016. Uh, and, and I'd been urging him to go from the day he got elected. And he goes there and he gives this talk in front of the cenotaph. You have to remember that I took students there for 25 years every summer for the commemorative events in August in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in front of the cenotaph, and I was there because the Japanese public broadcaster, NHK, brought me over there to do commentary for Obama's visit. And Obama says, on a clear, bright, sunny morning, two bombs uh, fell from the sky. No, the United States dropped two bombs. Death and destruction did not fall from the sky. But then it goes on to repeat the big lie that's involved in this whole mythology. And he says, World War II reached this brutal end in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Bullshit. That's not what happened. And Obama should know that. Um, but, but that's the lie. And if you keep on repeating that, then you can at least try to justify the atomic bombing because you can say that they sped up the end of the war. And that the American lie was that, that, that the United States, if they didn't use the atomic bombs, the only alternative for getting the fanatical Japanese to surrender was to invade. And Truman says in his memoir, the general marshal told me we would lose a half million men in an invasion. Truman starts off actually after the bombing saying we saved thousands of American lives. Now it's up to a half million. It later grows to a million. George H.W. Bush says millions. Others say six million American lives. It's nonsense. We were not going to invade after, after we had the bomb. It was either change the surrender terms or you know, use the atomic bomb. But it was not going to be an invasion at that point on. Uh, but that's the lie that as wow. the heart of American exceptionalism, the American empire that were so benevolent that we use the bomb uh, in order to save not only American lives, but Japanese lives, but Chinese lives. It was actually a humane act when in reality it put the world on a glide path to ending life on our planet. And we're still dealing with that every minute of every day today. Wow. You know, one of the things I did want to bring up, and you brought up, I'm glad you brought it up. The other day, um, there was the uh, uh, President Biden, you know, there was notwithstanding some of the uh, very odd, so, so, you know, trying to sit down in the middle. And there was some weird stuff with President Biden. Certainly he seems to have some cognitive issues, but we won't get into that. But his his discussion this this concept of rewriting history is really confounding me. Everything from the a literal Nazi Waffen SS soldier in being a, 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 a standing ovation in uh, the Canadian Parliament, right? Oh, yeah. And now we get D Day, 
a rewriting of history. Hooray! Uh, uh, Russians are dying on D-Day at a time when there should be a celebration or there should be at least a discussion that the powers came together and they recognized what the Nazis were doing and they stopped them. We could get into a lot of discussion about who armed the Nazis beforehand and bankrolled them and that's all. But, but let's just focus on what happened on D-Day at this particular dangerous time right now and your thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I say that D-Day was a heroic event on the part of the Americans and the Brits and the other Europeans who participated. Uh, it came a year and a half too late. You know, it was not insignificant in ending the war, but the war had already largely been won by the Soviet Union by that point. Throughout most of the war, and, you know, and this is another one of those myths because most Americans, if you ask them who won World War II in Europe, of course they say the United States won it. But it's not only the Americans. In France, in France, in May of 45, they did a survey and they asked the French people who who gets the major responsibility for defeating the Nazis. 57% of the French said that the uh, um, that the Soviets deserve the major responsibility for defeating the Nazis. Recently, in the past decade, when the French were asked again, 7% said that the Soviets uh, contributed significantly, not the major, but even made a, ma a significant contribution to the Allied victory against Germany. Across the rest of Europe, 13% credited the Soviets with playing a major role. The reality, of course, as even Winston Churchill said, the Red Army tore the guts out of the Nazi war machine. Throughout most of the war, the Soviets confronted 200 German divisions by themselves, while the Americans and the Brits were confronting 10 between us. You know, there's a reason why. What was that? No, I didn't hear the first. What was the first number that the Soviets were? More facing? than 200. The Soviets were, were confronting more than 200 alone, while the Americans, the Brits, faced 10 between us. Uh, it, uh, and Roosevelt understood that, which is why in May of 45, he asked Stalin to send over Foreign Minister Molotov and a trusted general to Washington. And they meet in Washington in late May with General Marshall. And Roosevelt turns to General Marshall and says, can we promise to open up the second front before the end of 1942? And Marshall says, absolutely. Eisenhower had already done studies on this. Not only did the Americans know they could do it, they wanted to do it because they knew that the Soviets were carrying the brunt of the fighting by themselves. And so they wanted to open up a second front in Western Europe before the end of 1942. But Churchill, after initially saying, OK, refused to go along with it. And so Roosevelt is desperate to get the Americans involved somewhere. So he decides on the invasion of North Africa in early 1943. The American military was furious about that. Marshall referred to this as periphery pecking and said that he was so angry with the Brits for their, for their cowardice, basically, that we should change our priorities and go after Japan first and let the British stew in their own juices. Uh, Eisenhower, who led the invasion of, of North Africa, said that when the U.S. invades North Africa instead of Europe, it will be the blackest day in American history. We finally, on D-Day, have the invasion that, that we promised a year and a half before. But by that point, it was a little bit too late. Not too late, but not to make a difference, because the U.S. had already been providing materiel to the Soviets that they desperately needed, which helped them resist the Nazis. But the Soviets had already pushed the Nazis back from Moscow after the initial invasion. So the Germans invade in June of 1941, and they they get, they try to get Moscow, but they weren't able to. And then in 42, we have the incredible Battle of Stalingrad. It begins in August August 23rd of 42, 
and it doesn't end till February 2nd of 1943. But that's the major turning point in the war, the first major defeat suffered by the Germans. Hitler says afterwards, the gods of war have changed sides and are now against us. That was followed by the great tank battle in Kursk. That was about, followed in 44 by the breaking of the siege of Leningrad. Maybe a million people died there. Among them was Vladimir Putin's older brother who died at the age of two. Vladimir Putin's father was badly wounded in, in, in Leningrad. I mean, this was a huge uh, turning point. So the uh, American entry into the war with the Brits in a serious way in June of 44 is going to speed up the end of the war. But the Soviets had already turned the tide. They had the, the Germans on the defensive. They were racing across Eastern and Central Europe, liberating the concentration camps, seeing the horrors of the Nazis. But we have to keep in mind the numbers. So 156,000 troops participated in D-Day. 4,400 brave soldiers, Americans and Brits and others died that day. We have to recognize and honor their sacrifice in the fight against fascism. And, and, we, and we do. And, but if you look at the American war movies about World War II, they almost all start with and focus on D-Day. The chronology is different. Okay, we get hit on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and then, uh, then, you know, we go to sleep for a while and we wake up and it's D-Day. And then Tom Hanks and the others, you know, brave men go and, and, and win the war. Uh, they're totally different chronology than the Russian chronology of the war, which begins June 22nd, 44, uh, 40, 41, with the German invasion. Uh, so, you know, the Soviets lost 27 million in World War II. 27 million. It's almost unfathomable. What John Kennedy said in his great American University commencement address in June of 63, which is had the anniversary, uh, John Kennedy said, what the Soviets suffered in World War II was the equivalent of the entire United States east of Chicago having been destroyed, having been wiped what was out. The, what was the, at the time they lost 27 million, my, my immediate uh, question is what percentage of the population, what was the population of Russia at that time? It's a good question. I don't have the immediate answer for you on that. It was a huge percentage you know, an inconceivable percentage of, of the Soviet population. Uh, not, you know, not only the Russians, but the Ukrainians and were, were slaughtered there and fought bravely. And, you know, they, there was a lot of like starvation and disease and things like that that people died from also, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, th these were not all soldiers. These were civilians. The majority were civilians. Uh, but that, you have to, you know, I, asked, I did an anonymous survey with college students, all of whom were A students in high school. And I asked them how many so how many Americans died in World War II? It was an anonymous survey. The median answer I got was 90,000. Okay, they were only 300,000 off. So at least they were sort of in the ballpark. I asked them how many Soviets died in World War II. The median answer I got was 100,000. They were only 27 million off which means they not only have no idea what World War II is about, they have no idea what the Cold War is about, they have no idea what the fighting in Ukraine is about. You can't understand the history. As Joe and Lai once said, the delightful things about Americans is that they have absolutely no historical memory. You know, he meant it ironically, of course, but it's true. And your thoughts on the uh, D-Day, the, 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 the events that happened, and, and particularly the speech by President Biden and the, again, what I see as an attempt or work to continually take us away from the reality of what happened in World War II and who was involved, which, of course, if you understand that, and, and this is what's important, you have to understand both sides. I've, I've talked about the word, uh, 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 what is it, the strategic uh, empathy, right? Even, it, you know, in law, if you're going to defend a case, 
you got you need to try to figure out what the prosecutor is going to do. You need to prosecute a case. You're going to run through, you know, well, well, I think the defense is going to come this way, that way. You're always trying to figure out what the what is it that they want? You know, do they want a deal? Do they want a, a you know, no, no prison time? You're always trying to figure out what the other side wants. To, that gives you a strategic advantage. What we seem to have now, we're at a point in history where when those of us who tried to use strategic ambi ambiguity, well, uh, based on historical things, based on, like you said, well, Vladimir Putin, look at his history. I try to understand this. He's a martial artist. How would a martial artist think? Any little tidbit of information you can use to try to figure out what the other side is thinking, right? Anything other than they are evil and evil must be conquered right. means you're a Russian bot and you're carrying Russian water for Russian propaganda, echoing Russian propaganda. When you're just saying, well, I'm just trying to figure out what both sides want so we can utilize that to come up with some idea of how to create an ending where everybody can walk away and we don't all die. That's not acceptable. Your thoughts on this D-Day discussion and what's going on around it and and how that how that um is reflected in this you, conversation carlin you're making such an important point when we think about american leaders who had the, who, who could and wanted to see the world through the eyes of our adversaries we think of roosevelt we think of henry wallace I think of John Kennedy during the last year of his presidency. I think of Jimmy Carter, not while he was president, but after he was president. He was a terrible president. He was a great former president, ex-president. You know, and, and then, but nobody today. You, you know, you take it back to, to D-Day. What does 27 million mean to people? It means one, what the Soviets suffered in World War II was the equivalent of one D-Day a day, every day for 18 years in terms wow. of the numbers who died. Wow. It's the equivalent of one 9-11 a day, every day for 24 years. The wow. equivalent of one Pearl Harbor a day, every day for 30 years. That's what the Soviets suffered. You would think we would have a little bit of empathy after World War II. And Wallace kept trying to impress on Truman what it looked like to the Soviets that we had a monopoly of atomic bombs, that we had air bases all over the world, that we had bombers that could bomb them from all over, that we had this booming economy while theirs had been destroyed, You know that we were the only country in the world that came out actually... During World War II, our economic growth rate was higher than any other time in our history, 15% a year. We would, you know, and, and, but we didn't. We didn't have any of that empathy, generosity, largesse, benevolence, and, and we haven't since, and we don't today. So Biden makes his speech there in Normandy, and he uses it. He doesn't once mention the alliance between the Americans and the Soviets. Doesn't once give the Russians any credit. In fact, the Russian Putin was not invited to Normandy again. Uh, and it's, they've been written out of the history. Uh, so and what Biden says is that the Russians are, he says, all of Europe will be threatened if we don't stop the Russians in Ukraine. This is so much another part of the lie. This is today's lie. The idea that if we don't stop Russia, they are going to go after next, they're going after the Baltic states, and they're going after Poland. And as Mike Johnson says, when he reverses himself and votes to, sang to give Ukraine the $61 billion that he'd been blocking before that, he says, well, I got the intelligence reports, and I see how dangerous the Russians are. And if we don't stop them there, they're going to gobble up one piece of Europe after another. Really? It defies logic. It defies reason. The defies Russians history. have a hard time even defeating the Ukrainians. They're going to want to go to war with NATO? I mean, Putin, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that, that I can say about Putin, uh, but it, he is not 
a madman. He's not a lunatic. He's not self-destructive. Well, if I could, if I, if I could, historically speaking, I can think of what was it, King Charles the Twelfth or whatever of Sweden who attacked the uh, the West. They attacked the Russians. The Crimean War. I can go to Hitler. I can go to a Napoleon. I can go on and on about the time Western Europe attacked Russia. Help me find when it was the other way around. You know what I mean? So historically speaking, the idea that the Russians are just sitting there drinking a cup of tea saying, no, not, not, how not, can we not, go, you know, how can we attack Europe? Historically speaking, as uh, I always like to say, uh, it's from a football coach of the Tuna, you know, uh, in, in New York, you are what your record says you are. The record of the Russians from the Russian Empire on is they don't have an inclination to attack Western Europe. And the idea that now, after everything that's happened, they're surrounded by bases that are creeping up to their border, that they're just sitting there saying, boy, we can't wait to make it to the uh, to the um, the English Channel. It defies logic. But the other thing is, and you know, you're a historian. One of the ways that we understand the world is history. One of the ways that we understand people. Oh, yeah. If you go to a psychiatrist, he'll say, tell me about your childhood. So it doesn't make sense logically what they're arguing. No, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and I mean, may, the Russians have historical ties to Ukraine that are different than their ties to the other European countries. I don't approve of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think it was provoked. As you mentioned, the NATO bases uh, up to Russia's border. You know, they got Ru Gorbachev, who gave Oliver Stone and me the first blurb we got on Untold History. Gorbachev was given a promise verbally in 1990 that NATO would not expand one inch to the east if he allowed the unification of Germany, which he did. And NATO, before the year was out, was planning its expansion. It didn't begin to enact it until 1998. But all the American statesmen who had any understanding at all, including the American ambassadors like Matlock and George Kennan, the architect of the Cold War, and Nietzsche and others, all said this would be the worst mistake we ever make if we expand NATO against Russia's will and its interests and its desires. And we did, and we kept expanding it more and more. And then in 2008, George W. Bush said he wants to fast track Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. And Putin blew a gasket at that point. Uh, and then with the coup in the Maidan. In well, you left something out. Actually, you left something out. In 2008, you know, the, well, I believe it was Bucharest, when when they, they we, the, the U.S. said, and I think it was April, okay, you know, we, well, well, we're going to bring in uh, uh, Georgia and, and, and Ukraine, right? Yeah. Well, within months, there was a war in Georgia. Yeah. You yes. know what I mean? I mean, so <laughs> within months, it had manifest, that, that had manifested itself in Georgia. It was clear yeah. that those were fighting words. Yes, absolutely clear. And we ignored it. And we ignored it. I would we, argue something even about, about Russia's bellicosity. Yeah. Um, I would argue that we didn't ignore it. I would argue this, that it was actually, what, what happened was malicious. I've made this point, Dr. Kuznick, and, and, and we'll disagree a little bit. I'll make this point. I'm an anti-war person. I'm opposed to war. But if I were the uh, 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 president of Russia, if I was the leader of Russia, and I read... Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski's Grand Chessboard. And I read the 2019 Rand Corporation document that said unbalancing and overextending Russia. If I watched the Americans and the Brits come together and talk about how they could balkanize Russia, how they could tear Russia apart, how they could take Russia apart. And then I saw the Maidan coup. And then they started building up. And let's not forget, a week before the um, and, and I saw the U.S. under Trump drop out of the INF Treaty. Right. So now we got intermediate nukes in the, in the game. And one week before the invasion, uh, Zelensky said we want to become a nuclear power again. If I was of, if I was the leader of Russia, I would have invaded then. 
I would have said, we cannot allow them to get nukes in Ukraine. Everything points to that. As much as I oppose war, if I were the leader of Russia, based on all of those things, it would be hard for me not to make those decisions. Go ahead. Uh, now, I, I, I would probably have made a very different decision, although I would have taken all that into account. I would have said that the opposition to Ukraine joining NATO in, at that point, Germany and France and others would mean that they would not be able to join NATO. Uh, and, and I would be clear that Ukraine would not be able to get nukes at that point. Uh, now, Ukraine did have the third biggest nuclear arsenal in the after the Soviet Union collapsed, and they gave up their nuclear weapons, fortunately. Uh, and then now they consider, of course, a great mistake that they did so. But uh, I would not have seen, I would have seen the, the uh, threat growing to the point where I would have been alarmed, but I would have held on with diplomacy, even at that point. Let me ask you a I question. Uh, why you, you would say that and, and how that did look to Putin and many of the Russians that, the, you know, the neocons, you mentioned uh, some of the grand chessboard. If you look at what Libby and Fife were saying, they uh, and Hadley, they were saying the exact same thing that Brzezinski says in the Grand Chessboard. You know that that we can make sure that Russia is never again a major Eurasian power and empire if we can can wrest Ukraine away from Russia. So they clearly wanted to do that, and they succeeded. And there was the the coup in 2014, and Yanukovych was overthrown, and then uh, then the you no know, then when we saw what happened in the Donbass and in Crimea, and we I think you also have to add this, of course, I, I, and I have to add a, a, another position, uh, a part of my because you know I'm, I'm very familiar with this scenario, and, and and I thought long and hard before I said this is what I would do over the course of time. The other issue is this: the issue of diplomacy, right? Um, they did Minsk Accords. So they come up with an agreement. Look, we don't want any trouble. Let's come up with this agreement. Will you honor the agreement? Yes, we will. They couldn't get them to honor the agreement. Over and over and over, the Russians said, will you honor the agreement? So I would argue that they had exhausted diplomacy in we want the Minsk Accords over and over. No. At that point, I have made a deal and we shook hands and you won't do it. Made a deal and shook hands. We won't do it. You no, I, you, you you shook on that deal. Yeah, are you going to do it? No. At that point, if I'm the Russians, I say I've, I've exhausted diplomacy. I made a deal with them. I did everything I could, and now I don't. Tr I have no trust left. And while Ukraine, and this is the way I like to put it, while Ukraine wasn't in NATO, NATO was in Ukraine. And the Brits said, you know what? We're going to build a, ba a base next fall on the Black Sea. And I think the Russians said, OK, we're getting. So while I, I can understand those who say and, and as an anti-war person, believe me, it's hard for me to ever say I do anything war wise. It hurts me to the core. Right. To everything fundamentally that I stand for. But based on strategic empathy, I look at it and I say, were I making that? I can't criticize that decision based when I take everything into account. It's difficult for me to criticize that decision. Yeah, and, and, and you know, in the nuclear age, I was war, afraid we were going to get to this part of the discussion. War, war, war just can't be an option. You know, you've you've got to keep going. There were more rounds of diplomacy that were possible. There are some people in the West who were still sane, and at that point, uh, the Ukrainians did not want to be part of NATO. The Ukrainians were very divided, and the Russians have such close historical as well as family ties with Ukraine that, so yes, you got Poroshenko there, uh, then you get Zelensky, uh, but Ukraine was not a lost cause yet. Despite the NATO aggression and despite the U.S. pushing for it, and you have to remember that the point man in the Obama administration on Ukraine was Biden. And so you've got Biden, 
you've got Victoria Newland, you've got these neocons, but the Americans were already war weary by 2014. And so, I mean, this was still a time when Bernie Sanders and the, and the progressives were not totally lost by that point. Now you look at the Democrats and they're warmongers on a scale with the right wing, with a lot of the Republicans. Um, and, and so I still think there was time, room for another couple of rounds, but you're right to say that Macron uh, and uh, 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 Angela Merkel, even though they signed off on Minsk, the Minsk agreements, they were stalling. They had no intention of implementing it. And certainly Zelensky and the Ukrainians had no intention of implementing it. And then later, when the negotiations after the invasion started, as you know, the, then they were negotiating through Turkey and others. And it looked like we had an agreement in March of 2022 to end it very quickly. And at that point, Boris Johnson, the clown, goes over there and press, pressures Zelensky not to negotiate. And the U.S. backs him up. And, you know, so this is a, not only is it a tragedy, it's a crime. What's I, I, I have an important question for you, because some things I want to learn about, some things that I don't know about that I think you could help me, you know, from a historical perspective. I'm a, I'm, I love to learn. I see some things going on and I need more. I, I, I'm sure you can you can answer these questions. I hope I'm not being selfish here, but but I think there are other people that don't know. One of the things I find interesting is that, you know, there's been such a history of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe. I look at the Baltic states, right? And I see that, you know, I'm, I didn't know this. I'm starting to learn that when the Nazis invaded, a whole bunch of the Baltic states sided with the Nazis. And I'm starting to, I didn't realize, I knew there was heavy anti-Semitism in a history of like pogroms and all kind of terrible things all throughout the, the you know, the, the Baltic states and the Eastern Europe. But if you can talk about, and that it seems to me that even now, that some, if not all, of the governments in that region trace their legacy to these political entities that sided with the Nazis. So if you could school me, shall we say, about the history in Eastern Europe of this fascism, this um, anti-Semitism, this Nazism, all that kind of stuff that I'm starting to learn about now, it seems pretty nasty. Yeah, my family learned about it the hard way. Yeah. Most of my relatives were killed in the Holocaust, you know, before I was born. My earliest memories were still of my grandmother sitting around the table crying and about all the dead relatives from years before. Wow. Uh, you know, so my family fled the pogroms. Uh, so I grew up with a consciousness and awareness of the ugliness of anti-Semitism. And, you know, the, one of the places got the worst, among the worst legacies of this was Ukraine. Uh, there was a very strong pro-Nazi element in Ukraine. Uh, the, um, and then, you know, what we just saw this week, the U.S. giving authorization after resisting this for years to arm and train the Azov uh, brigades now. Uh, we knew we tr they were founded by Beletsky, who was an outspoken neo-Nazi back in 2014. They represented the most, worst of the right-wing ultra-nationalist neo-Nazi fa neo faction there, the Banderites that go back to World War II and were responsible for aiding in the killing of tens of thousands of Jews in Ukraine, where there were a huge number was slaughtered. Uh, and we saw those elements, as you say, in other parts of Eastern Europe after Eastern Europe also. You've got Galen uh, being absorbed into the CIA and into American intelligence after World War II. You've got a lot of these neo-Nazi types who were very active in American sabotage efforts in Eastern Europe people we left behind to start an uprising in case we were ready to do so. We used to parachute these people behind Soviet lines in Ukraine. You know, that with, with the whole forest all, uh, 
uh, suicide ties back into Operation Nightingale, which was a major CIA operation behind Soviet lines in Western Ukraine. So, I mean, we've got a very ugly history of working with some of the worst of the anti-Semites and using that uh, and then even using the kind of studies and intelligence that they came up with. Uh, I, let me say this. Near where I live, there's a, you might have heard of it, Gibson Island. Yeah. Gibson Island is an exclusive island, very, very wealthy people there. You can't get off. I knew people on Gibson Island and been on the back and forth on there. But I had someone on Gibson Island tell me, maybe 20 years ago or so, this is in America. Tell me that, you, you know, his family had been on there for a long, long time. And that at one point it was written in basically when you bought a house there, whatever they had, the neighbor cover or whatever, that you could not sell to Jewish people. Yes. It was written in there. No Jews allowed. You were not allowed. Everything had to be approved. And that and he's this was maybe 20 years ago or so. And he said, even after that was no longer written. It had to be approved by whatever the neighborhood, you know, the islands, whatever, if you sold and they weren't going to approve it if there was Jewish people. So the 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 reality is that America was aligned ideologically with a lot. It's it's not shocking that America brought a lot of these people over here because they were ideologically aligned with them over here. Yeah. And, and you know, this, those same restrictive covenants that were written about Jews not being allowed to buy houses in those neighborhoods was, of course, also written about blacks not being allowed. Well, they didn't even have to write them. Then, <laughs> they were axiomatic. <laughs> they didn't have self-evident. They didn't have to write that yeah. at all. Oh, I, I remember the debates in the 60s when those communities uh, were still enforcing that against black people. And it was, it was very ugly. But we wrote it into our housing codes. You know, the, the, the redlining of those districts where they would not, if there was one black family on a block, it was considered a black block and there was no, you're not going to get the lowest rating for giving loans and federal and federal aid. You know, why, uh, I remember some years ago reading that f about 40% of the housing in England and France was public housing. In the United States, 1% of the housing is public housing. And those are always put in the most impoverished communities. So, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's a lot of that American that history when I that hear, is very, very unfortunate. When I hear today, when I see the, you know, Latvian or Lithuanian, you know, whatever the hell, one of those countries, and I see these people on, and they're saying these virulent anti-Russian things. They're passing these anti-Russian laws. I mean, it's a racial thing with them. It clearly, it, 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 well, it, it, it doesn't feel good. It feels like if the Nazis were to come marching back into Latvia or Lithuania or something like that, I'm just saying, this yeah. is the way it feels to me, that these people are saying, we have to pass laws so that Russian speakers have to be thrown out of the country. They're not allowed to drive. They're not allowed. I just look at them and I say, you know, if somebody was to come marching back in with a bunch of tanks with, you know, the crooked cross all over them, I think you guys would welcome them again. I mean, they, that's the way it seems when I hear that kind of stuff coming out of the mouth of some of these people in Eastern Europe Europe now. Uh, you, you know, it's scary. These recent European Parliament elections that just occurred this week, uh, the results about the rise of the right wing across the board in Europe, uh, you know, is, is frightening. Now, it, but it's a mixed bag because on the one hand, most many of these right wing populist parties that are getting so much support, it's because they don't want to, because they're anti war. But they're also misogynist. They're also anti immigrant. They're also racist. They're also anti Semitic. You know, what's crazy world we live in now, where some of the people who almost seem to be sane when it comes to not wanting to continue these wars are also so dangerous when it comes to other ideas. And we see a lot of that same tendency in the United States with these MAGA Republicans uh, who can be more anti-war than many of the progressive Democrats, which is shocking to me. Uh, 
given given the, well, the Democrats have gone into, you know, I've made this statement. I don't want to get into, into it much. If I can argue that the ultra nationalist is fascism, ultra something or other, the ultra liberalism, which gets to a point now of what I'm seeing with the anti-Russian, with the anti-China, with these so-called liberals wanting to militarize the Pacific, wanting to surround China with, and they're calling themselves liberals. Let's surround China with missiles. You know, let's not make, um, uh, let's not talk about a peaceful resolution anywhere. Anywhere, there's no diplomacy. No diplomacy, diplomacy and peace have become dirty words. In the, and in that's kind of like fascism to me. Like, to me, one of the foundations of fascism, to me, is a commitment to war. Yeah. And and, and, and it, it's it, a flavor. It, Maybe, you know, it's like vanilla or butter pecan. There's different flavors of fascism. But whatever it is, when I see the commitment to war that we have, when I see people like Kurt Campbell, who talked about a symphony of death, for God's sake, in, 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 in Asia, I, I, I just look at it and I say, and you go, know, we've gone to a very bad place here. And and that's it was very frightening because when after Wendy Sherman resigned, uh, retired as a number two in the State Department, Victoria Newland took it over. She was the acting number two for months. And then they a few months, a couple months ago, finally decided to replace her permanently or to replace Wendy Sherman. And everybody thought that Victoria Newland, who's the biggest Russia hater, was going to get it. But they passed over her and chose, chose Kurt Campbell, who's the biggest China hawk in the, number two. Uh, you know, I, I would go back to some of the old liberals, Jimmy Carter. Uh, Jimmy Carter said a few years ago, I think it was 2019, he said that, uh, says he said, it said a, a, a sermon before a congregation in Georgia. He said he had spoken to, to Donald Trump a couple days ago, and Trump was very concerned about China and the rise of China. And Jimmy Carter said, I'm not worried about China. He said, China, you know uh, how many times China's been at war or invaded anybody since 1979? Zero. He said, you know how many times the United States has been at war? Constantly. He said that the United States is the greatest warmonger in the world today. He said, if we look at American history, he said, I look back at 242 years of American history, the United States has known peace for only 16 of those years. He said, the greatest warmonger in history. And that was Jimmy Carter. You know, and, and so this militarization of the Pacific, which is another thing that we could talk a lot about if we had more time, uh, is also just growing more and more dangerous, provocative. We are faced now with war on three or four fronts and maybe more. Uh, clearly Gaza is a nightmare, which could only get worse, sadly. Uh, the situation around Taiwan and the South China Sea is, is really the most dangerous in the long term. And then the situation around Ukraine now with the NATO expansion, NATO aggression, NATO pulling out all the stops, NATO ignoring all of Russia's red lines. We are closer to nuclear war on, in that region than any place else in the world right now. You've got to add something else. And I, I've reported on this. The U.S. on a number of occasions has sent um, here recently for the first time nuclear armed submarines to the Korean Peninsula to dock. So now it's bad enough that we're always doing flying these exercises where we do faux attacks or uh, nuclear attacks on North Korea. But now we send we send um, uh, uh, nuclear subs there yeah. and we say that North Korea is paranoid. Uh, you know, uh, Jeff, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, I heard him say, look. When Donald Trump first came to the Korean Peninsula, he said they told him, look what we're going to do. And they took a nuclear capable plane. They flew it to the you know 38th parallel, whatever. And at the last second, it turned off. And they said, see, we are showing that we could attack them. And he said, Donald Trump looked at it and said, that's crazy. Why are we doing that? Because Donald Trump, you know, for all of his whatever you like or don't like about him, he's not part of that machine. And he didn't real know, OK, this is what we do. So 
here for all of these other things that horrible things we are now uh recently they were shooting across the border in Korea. so the korean peninsula it seems like under the biden administration the the only place they don't have a pending nuclear confrontation is on the moon and i suspect that's coming it's horrifying well and we did have plans after the soviets launched sputnik in 1957 and the americans were humiliated the soviets beat us in launching satellites we did have a plan to detonate hydrogen bombs on the surface of the moon you know and that was going to supposedly impress the world and show that the united states is still number one at the at the time i f stone the great independent journalist said we should remember that the latin word for moon is luna and we should we should have a new department uh and call it the Department of Lunacy. <laughs> you know? uh, and, and Carl Sagan was one of the people who did the studies on that and, and was able to convince them that this would not be a good idea to detonate Carl Sagan, on the moon. So Carl Sagan, you know, it happened. Carl Sagan, a man who, if I am if I remember correctly, said that um, the nuclear arms race was like four people standing waist deep in gasoline. One guy saying, I've got a match. Another says, I got two. Another says, I got three. I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing, of course. But that was one of the most accurate representations of the nuclear race that I've ever heard. It's just we're all sitting around saying, and, and, and uh, well, you know, we've done an hour. I think it was a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot and I think it was a great conversation. I think the people who were watching really loved it and um and 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 enjoyed it. I would like to hopefully if you're available in another week or two, maybe another couple weeks, do an episode 2 and I'll come up with some issues, email you, we can work with it and come up with some other things to talk about if that would work out for you. Let's 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 among them, let's talk about increasing insanity around Ukraine now and how dangerous that is and the militarization of the Pacific, you know, and the, yeah, with, with, those would be two topics that will give us another hour. That Wonderful. Cause we, we had to do a lot of history today. Well, we did cause I needed to learn a lot before we move further. So excellent. Okay. Well, I'll send you an email and hopefully next week or the week after, depending upon how your schedule looks, we can, we can, uh, we can, we can do Ukraine and the militarization of the of Pacific. Right. Thank you everyone. Um, it's very important for those of you who um, have um, uh, uh, social media accounts on other platforms, please um, follow me on Rockfin of YouTube and of course, Rumble, and share these uh, videos on all of your social media platforms. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kuznick. I really appreciate it uh, and appreciate the great work you do. Thank you, Garland. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, as I said, share this on all your social media platforms. I think this is an important discussion, and I'm looking forward to have more, uh, having more important discussions with uh, uh, Dr. Kuznick. And hopefully, you know, people like us. I know um, some people over at the press club yesterday had a number of people at the National Press Club in, in D.C. talking about this issue of nuclear confrontation. So I think there are more and more people working on this, understanding the dangers that we're in. In, yeah. And um, I, I'm happy to be part of it. Thank you very much, Dr. Right. Peter Kuzi. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Don't forget to share it. All right.